crazy horse. We hear what you say. One earth, one mother. One does not sell the earth. The people walk upon. We are the land. How do we sell our mother? How do we sell the star? How do we sell the air? Crazy horse. We hear what you say. Hey, I'm David Liberty, a member of the Umatilla tribe, with my co-host over here, Adam Whitestone. Adam Dene. <laughs> And we've got a special guest with us tonight, Chris Francisco. And we're going to be talking with him for a good portion of the show. Unless our other guest shows up, then we'll be cutting him off and going to our other guest. So it's all a tentative. That's the thing with live TV. You never know what's going to happen. So, Chris, thanks yes. a lot for coming here tonight. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Okay. And I know... Basically, we're going to talk about Chris's involvement in the Longest Walk 3, the northern route. But, uh, Chris, I probably want to just give you a chance, first of all, to introduce yourself. Tell us a little about your tribal heritage, your background, what you're doing these days. Um, my name is uh, Chris Francisco. I'm from uh, Shiprock, New Mexico, and I'm Diné. And um, I graduated from uh, Portland State with a major in films and a minor in theater this past spring and um, I'm coordinating the uh, longest walk northern route starting from Portland going all the, all the way to uh, Washington DC for uh, diabetes making awareness on uh, diabetes in Indian country and um, well, you're not diabetic are you yeah I'm you're diabetic oh you are yeah, diabetic. I'm diabetic okay. man I'm sorry how long have you been battling that um, I, well, you know, just like um, the reason why we're walking is to uh, create awareness and to uh, get people to understand about diabetes. Like there's so many of us that are out there, uh, like me, for instance, um, I, I was diagnosed as a diabetic, but I really didn't take it seriously. You know, um, like Dennis Banks was one of the people uh, that was diagnosed as a diabetic and I, I think he had a slight heart attack. and. From that point, he took it personal and he decided that he wanted to uh, um, create an awareness on the diabetes throughout Indian country. So at the same time, you know, I'm a diabetic too. So um, I was diagnosed a couple of years ago when I was in treatment. You know, I went through a NARA treatment center and, you know, they, they check you physically and see what's wrong with you. And uh, they, they found out that, you know, a lot of uh, alcoholics and drug, drug addicts, you know, they, they become diabetics, you know, from... Uh, probably the, a lot of the the sugar and the alcohol mm -hmm. so that's when I found out but the thing the thing um, I think a lot of native people are just like me they we know we are but we're not you know active in it we're not you know trying to exercise or trying to eat right you know vegetables fruits you know good food that are um, good for our bodies you know and you know, our ancestors, you know, they, they did a lot of hunting, they did a lot of walking, and they worked a lot, and there was no McDonald's or Burger King and stuff like that back in the day. Not much sugar either. Yeah, so I think the only sugar they had was, uh, like, berries and apricots, you know, stuff like yeah. that. But then it was always, like, none of that candy stuff, you know, like the, that sugar from the candy. So yeah. so, I, so that's the whole reason for the walk is to uh, get people to... Uh, um, begin to understand the truth about diabetes and begin to uh, get out of that denial of saying, you know, I'm not a diabetic or, you know, become active in trying to exercise and eat the right kinds of foods. Um, and probably, you know, uh, what we need to do is also like plant our own vegetables, you know, our own gardens and stuff. So and, and go back to the way uh, our ancestors used to live, you know, like gathering all the um, berries or whatever you know herbs that they gather gather and go back to go back to that because you know we need to uh, like survive continue this survival you know we're um, constantly surviving all kinds of stuff genocide assimilation and now is our health you know you know the, so we have to really um, begin to become active and, and, and start doing these things for our future generation. You know, we got kids coming into the world, our grandkids, 
you know, what we're saying is that we want people to uh, stay alive a little longer, you know, and, you know, see their grandkids and be healthy. And I think from just being healthy and being an example to our families, relatives, and kids, I think they'll become, start becoming healthy too. And I think even just being healthy, you know, your mind is healthy, you know, like in the Navajo way, you know, there's, um, you know, they, they, shay, they say it's not just, you know, walking in beauty. It's, there's a whole lot of things that, that, that is involved with it, you know, our mental and our social, you know, our, our you know, spirituality and our, you know, physically, physical bodies, you know, that all becomes like one, one whole. And that's the, you know, walking in beauty. So that's what we're trying to say with this uh, northern route. And I decided to do that because I'm a diabetic too. And just trying to make awareness about that. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear that you have diabetes. Oh, that's um, no problem. But speaking of native foods, right now, if you get out there in the mountains, the uh, huckleberries are coming on real strong. And back on my res, we just had our huckleberry feast last Sunday. So I was out Tuesday up in the hills picking by Lost Lake and showing my granddaughter what plants to find the berries on and uh, huckleberries are just delicious. So it's a good time to get out and pick huckleberries. And like Chris was saying, foods like that are natural, they're good for you, and they'll make you healthier than the foods that you buy at the store. Well, even the berries that are raised with uh, pesticides and stuff, they're all natural. So that's the good thing about eating huckleberries this time of year. Yeah, I think that's the one thing that's hurting uh, as as people go, as like uh, American people, you know, as these children grow up, they eat all this, 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 like again, processed food, stuff that uh, is, you know, trying to make chickens bigger so they last a longer meal, you know, even though plump them up with all this stuff. And of course, the kids, they all grow tall, grow, you know, like, you know, they grow big because of all that steroids and stuff in them. And, you know, you always look back, like I always look back, back in like, you know, the images of the 70s and 60s, everybody was small and petite, you know, like with the food wasn't, wasn't you know, like McDonald's or processed as much, you know, like people didn't eat it. They had their home cooked meals every day. You know, people tell me they have home cooked meal and then maybe out, some, some fast food like once a month, once a month, you know, but now people are doing it every day. And so same thing with diabetes, the, the more junk food, the more sugar, more everything you eat, you know, because I'm uh, a pre-diabetes, you know, if my mom has it and, you know, I'm at risk. So now, you know, now, of course, we got to realize it and start exercising and take care of our body. You know, somebody says, oh, you want a candy bar, you want a soda or something or, you know, it's like, ah, I choose not to sometimes, you know, like, oh, I don't want it or, you know, I won't eat the rest of the you know, something that's really sugary, a pie or something, you know, it's just like, you know, once you have diabetes, you know, there's a way to reverse it, but once you have it and, you know, a lot of people, they don't really care about it, you know, they just uh, go through life and kind of like don't tell nobody that they are diabetic and then you, then you hear about them dying or something, you hear about them are really sick because they have diabetes and they don't, they don't take care of it, they don't, they don't do the necessary things. And this is why, you know, this, this is another reason why this walk is so important, especially for me as a young, as a young buck, you know, a young person that uh, even though, you know, Chris, you know, he took on this, this walk, but it should be, you know, all of us, this, all the young people should be coming on this walk. And I know it's all the way to heck across the United States, you know, but this will, this will, this will be a start, a start for something for our people. This will be like, hey, somebody's taking this challenge on. Because anybody can talk about it. Anybody can just go, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to walk across. We're going to do this. There's got to be somebody that will, is willing to walk all the way across mm -hmm. to do it. You know, because there's been a lot of talkers about doing this walk. And uh, Chris Francisco is like, hey, man, we got nothing to do, you know. You know, he's going to go do it. You know, so we're going to get him all ready to go to get over there. You know, I'll probably be in school. I need to go to school, but... Maybe there'll be a longest walk for another diabetes, reversing diabetes, and, uh, you know, you never know. <laughs> well, diabetes really is a big issue back on my res, and you see people in wheelchairs because first they'll lose their feet, and then they'll lose their lower legs, and, yeah. you know, that's a direct result of diabetes from the lack of circulation to your extremities. So we really can see the visual evidence of what diabetes can do to you. 
But Chris, I'm really proud of you for stepping out and taking charge for the Oregon chapter. Now, you're looking for help for people all across the country, right, to help you out with this walk? Yeah, we're looking, uh, first of all, we're really encouraging young people to uh, uh, walk with us because um, they're the ones that are going to be, they're, they're the, our, our strength and our energy. They're the ones that are probably will be running for us, you know, and they're the ones that are going to be walking. And, and it's not too late to uh, reverse that. You don't have to get your legs cut off, you, you know, or anything. If you begin today, start right now, you know, start walking and start eating the right kinds of foods. And, and so, yes, we, we're, we have a, on our Facebook page, it's Longest Walk Northern Route. And make sure uh, the W, this right here, Make sure that's capitalized, and the R is capitalized, too, right there. Yeah. Very important. Yeah, because or else you, will, you, won't find, you won't find us if those two. And longest walk is one word. Northern route is another one word, too. They're put together. So if you get on Facebook and you're looking for us, you have to write it that way in order to find us. And we have uh, on that page, we have uh, responsibilities of the um, state coordinators. And we have like notes on there. If you look on Facebook, it's on our page. It's on the bottom left side. And you look on there and we have all the responsibilities that uh, state coordinators, they um, need to do. And, um, and there's like videos on there from the previous walk in 78 and 2008. We got videos on there you can watch and see what was going on. And, and right now we're just looking for uh, um, people across the country to become state coordinators and to uh, help us out because we can't do it with, without their help, without your help, because we're just walking and our life is, in, is gonna be depending on you, you know, whether we make this walk or not. We have to work together, we have to, or else we're not gonna uh, accomplish this mission. And we're gonna have, you, uh, the state coordinators have to find the permits on these highways that we can walk on without being harassed by the cops. You know, if you look at one of the videos from 2008 on Ohio, you know, they, they didn't have a permit and the, you know, people got thrown in jail, you know, got handcuffed and there was like oh, kids crying and, you know, it was like a big old chaos. And we don't want that to happen again. We want people to be uh, healthy. We want them safe, you know, all the way to DC. We don't want, you know, no fights, no alcohol, no drugs, no, none of that stuff. And, and we're, we're relying on the people. This is a people's movement. This is your movement. This is our movement, too. We can't do it without you. So it's a people's movement. And if you go on that site, you'll find out these responsibilities that they need to do. So it's really like all of us, all of us going to help. If you have like uh, some relatives that are, you know, going through di diabetes, you know, um, you know, help us out, you know, and, and you know, we're going to make it to D.C. And, and probably talk a lot about the health care. Um, in Indian country, because in the Indian country, you know, we, we're still waiting for Obama, you know, to give us good health care. You know, he's working on the schools and all these promises that Obama made, you know, uh, towards the uh, Native people a while back. And those are the promises that we're going to confront him with and let him know that, okay, hey, we need uh, health care. Not only like diabetes, doesn't, I don't think it actually does come from like just like eating bad food, I think it also comes from contamination in the land, you know, contamination of water, mm -hmm. mercury in the water, there's, a, um, there's a acid rain that comes into the crop and then into the water and we eat the, the uh, vegetables and, you know, we're just like drinking this water and, and the whole planet, you know, it's, it's really starting, Mother Earth is getting contaminated. And so, uh, you know, that, that's another issue, too, that's related to diabetes, man. I mean, it's like this whole thing is, uh, this machine is uh, working to destroy mankind, not only us, but, you know, our relations, you know, the, the ones that crawl, the ones that fly, the ones that swim, you know, the green relatives, the trees and the plants, you know, it affects all of us, not just, you know, native people, you know, white people that have diabetes, too. I was walking on, I started a walking club, and... Um, I'm trying to get people to come out and walk with me. And it's a 10-mile ten, ten hike from St. John's side to uh, um, Burnside, and it's like 10 miles. And on the way, I met this uh, white dude, and I asked him, man, you know, he was talking to me, and, and, and he was telling me all these things that, um, that was going on. And, and, um, and I told him, you know, you know, we're walking for diabetes. And then he, he came to explain to me that, that um, 
that he's a diabetic too. So, so I know that it's not just affecting native people, it's also affecting um, um, <laughs> white people, black people, you know, all kinds of people. So, so that's, um, so it, it affects everybody, it affects the whole planet. Well, let's get back to this, if somebody wanted to join your walk, when, where and when and what, where do you meet, where do you start, what time? Uh, you can start by going to our uh, Facebook uh, page and, you know, shoot us an email. And on that uh, Facebook, it has my phone number on there. I have my cell phone on. Okay. Call me and ask me, you know, if you want to help support. We're looking, like, here in the state of Oregon, um, we're looking for, like, people to help us volunteer to uh, do benefits, you know, like benefit concerts, I don't know, car washes, just to raise funds so we can, you know, start walking from here. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to take care of us all the way to the border of uh, Idaho. And then the people from whoever is going to be the state coordinator of Idaho takes over from right there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's simple. Just call me. Get, uh, my number is 503-515-6239. Uh, and just call me up and ask me, you know, uh, how, how do I do this? How can I participate? How can I, uh, you know, help fundraise? And maybe you just want to walk a few miles, you know, like... Adams, you know, he, he, he's got to be in school and he's got, he's got, you know, business to take care of here. So people can just walk as many miles as they can with us. You know, maybe you want to walk a couple of miles and that's cool. You know, just jump on and walk with us and, you know, and turn around or whatever or go to the end of Oregon, you know. And I think the most important thing that I've learned from the previous walk that people warned me about is that, we, you know, they ran out of food and they ran out, they ran out of gas money. So we really need that, you know, the food and the gas, you know, they keep moving, you know, because mm -hmm. there, there will be support vehicles. And if you got like a, a big old truck that hauls all our supplies and our cooking supplies and stuff like that, you know, that's going to take um, a lot of gas. And, the, and support vehicles, they're there for people who get tired so they can, you know, take a break and let the... You know, like I said, we need the young people to stand with us on this and let the young people... I mean, not people that, you know, that aren't teenage years or anything like that. I'm, I think, you know, I don't think their parents would let them go. But, you know, after they're 18, you know, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're on their own and, you know, make that choice. They want to come. We need their strength and their energy because on the previous walk, a lot of old people were on that walk and they had to sit in the support vehicles. And so you got to pay that gas for the mm -hmm. support vehicles. And that takes a lot of gas money. So we're gas cars, whatever you guys can help us out with. And. You know, that, that, that's something that we would really appreciate in order to get to uh, Idaho, and Idaho people will take over from there. And when does it start? It starts uh, February 14th. Okay, so the young kids will be in school. Yeah, yeah, February. the young people, re but after they're 18 or something, maybe some of them want to, you know, if they're out of school and stuff, you know, I'm not saying, you know, ditch school for five months. No way. By, by, by all means, stay in school and get your education. That's important, too, you know. But if they, you know, got nothing to do and they finish school or something, you know, they can come with us and, and uh, you know, with their parents' consent, you know, and make sure, sure that everything's cool before they come. Because we don't want to be reliable for anybody. On the last walk, some people got a heart attack. So that's why mm -hmm. we're starting this walking group here in Portland to uh, get people trained and ready, you know, to walk. Because I walked that 10 miles that first day. Man. It nearly killed me, man. I'll bet. I mean, I was like walking bow-legged and my feet were, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it was tough. But as I walked every day from downtown back to St. John's, I'm starting to get used to it now. Then I took another walk the, uh, this past weekend on uh, Forest Park Trail. Man, it wasn't as bad as the first one. So if you jump on this walk, cold feet, you know, like not no exercise and not taking care of yourself, it's going to be hard. And a lot of injuries are going to come and like, you know, that, that person that had a heart attack last time, I guess I don't think she really took care of herself and, you know, got sick and they had to haul her to the uh, hospital. So that's what's something that we're afraid of too. We don't want to be reliable of those things. And so please do a lot of walking, eat right, drink a lot of water, be prepared. And the first few months, it's going to be cold. It, you know, we're going through uh, uh, Idaho and Wyoming and, uh, you know, like Nebraska, and that's like way north. and. It's going to be um, really cold in those areas, in those territories. And, you know, just, just be prepared. You know, don't, you know, play it smart is all we're asking, you know. So that our job will be a lot easier because we're going to have to be, like, coordinating what's up ahead, you know, communicating with people up ahead and make sure that everyone is safe, you know, everyone has a warm place to stay and 
the sick people can be taken care of. You know, we don't have a medic yet. We also need a medic mm -hmm. to be on a walk with us. Yeah. And, you know, we've got all these uh, detailed, you know, complications that, that has to be. We got f six months to work on it. And we, did, we joined this uh, a little too late. You know, uh, we should have done it a couple of years ago when Dennis Banks asked us. So we're, we're just now getting on this. And, and that, that's, you know, our problem that we made that mistake. But so we're, that's, but I think we, through prayer and through people helping us and, you know, making this a people's movement, I think uh, we'd be able to make it to D.C., man. We just have to continue to work hard and network together to make this happen. And it's going to take all of us. Now, what about the local walking group or walking club or do you have a group of people that you walk with regularly? Well, there's only me right now. Like I said, oh. I've just been walking Forest Park and trying to, like, if you go onto Facebook, you'll see, you know, you'll see pictures that I've taken in our photo album of all the nice looking flowers that are up there and the trail is really nice as well traveled, you know. Yeah. And um, I think Adam's going to come out with me, too, man. I mean, I, some people, they haven't called me or nothing yet. You know, we're just getting started. Okay. You know, we, we got on Facebook about like a week ago. Yeah. You know, we're just getting started. You know, that's why okay. we're here. We don't have like all the information. We don't have the, the, the route map. We don't have none of that. Some guy from back east is supposed to like uh, make us a map. And, and when that comes in, then people will see what, which route we're taking. So those people that close that live close by can come and join us or they can join from wherever mm -hmm. they're at. And, and, you know, right now we're just getting started. We're just getting organized. And we've got this walking group and we're trying to, you know, if there's anybody that wants to help us fundraise, like with a benefit concert or uh, whatever it is, we need your, we need, we need your ideas. We need your input because this is your movement too. You know, it's, I know everybody's got a diabetic member in their family and do it for them, you know, do it for the people, you know, you're not doing it for me, you know, I, I'm mm -hmm. just like, I'm just a diabetic and I'm doing it for myself to walk there, you know, like yeah. do it for your family members, you know, I think that will put a lot more passion and a lot more drive in, into what you're doing, you know, in, into what the volunteers are doing. And, and, I, and I, think, I think it's still possible that we can still make it to DC, even though we got a late start and everything's still kind of like chaos right now, but I think, it, I think it'll work. I believe in it. Well, at least you have an Oregon coordinator to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Idaho, that's kind of your next step is getting somebody in Idaho mm -hmm. to line things out. So one state at a time, Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, and hence to We got DC. like one lady in, in um, Wyoming, in Ithiti, and they want us to go up there to the reservation. She says diabetes is really bad on their reservation. So we're going to walk up there and, you know, make awareness, you know, like talk to the people up there. And okay. so all these people are starting to ask us so that the route may kind of change as we go. Some people, Native people may want us to come to the res and, you know, they want us to, you know, I don't know, chill out and talk with them or whatever, man. And that's cool, too. We can go up there and hang out with them and, you know, do. We also have a... Um, I wrote a play called Kill the Savage Mind, and we have, like, we're going to be uh, reading that along the way, too, to, you know, oh, generate money oh. for our own selves. You know, we, we're going to, like, every night, wherever we stop, we're going to pull out the scripts, and we're going to sit down, we're going to do a, a reading of the play that I wrote. And, oh. and we're going to be doing, as a fundraiser, we're going to be using that here in Portland, too. Uh, Adam is part of it. You know, we got Tabitha Whitefoot. We got uh, Matt. Um, Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, Vi, uh, a lot of AIM members, you know, they're, they're, they're coming out and, and helping us in that way, you know, to, to you know, fundraise for ourselves and to do these readings. We're going to be like, I don't know, all over Portland, and we'll probably go up to, I don't know, Seattle or Olympia and down to Eugene. And so if you see anything about the uh, Red Grail Theater Group, you know, come and see us, check us out, and, and you know, help, help us, fund us through that way, you know what I'm saying? And that's the way we're going to get our money, or maybe you just want to give us a gas card. And that's cool, too, man. We can use a gas card. So you have a script, screenplay? Uh, no, it's a, a, a short play, a theater short, play. Yeah. Short play. Yeah, that I wrote while I was in school. And is it about diabetes? Uh, it's, it's about the boarding school era. It's kind of like the uh, institution mm -hmm. versus um, the traditional way of thinking. Two different perspectives. It's like two worlds that we are Native people we always talk about. You know, we, It's not like back in the 1800s, but it's... it's kind of more modern like like it starts in 1966 you know where this little kid goes off to boarding school his grandmother wants to keep him at home but you know 
They, you can't do that. And, you know, it's against the law to, you know, kids not going to school. But I think the whole idea of what I was saying was that Captain C. Pratt never came to our elders. Captain C. Pratt never came to our tribal council or, or to our leaders and our elders and say, we're going to build this boarding school. Uh, we want your input to tell us how we should teach your children. He never did. It was always <laughs> one-sided. <laughs> Religion, you know, they wrote the history and they told us their side of the history. And they always like a military setting. You know, yeah. it's like we're being brainwashed. We're being assimilated into the system. And so this play is, is about that. It kind of gives you like a, the process of th how this kid evolved into uh, from the boarding school to the reformatory school and then to the penitentiary. Then at the end, he dies for, the free, for his freedom of religion, which his grandmother was telling him at the beginning. But I really don't want to tell, give out the Yeah, you know, don't tell the whole, whole story. Thing. Don't ruin <laughs> it. You've got to come and check it out. You've got to come, you and gotta come it and see it. That's yeah. right. <laughs> So I think the one thing to say, one, one more last thing uh, real quick, is to make this longest walk would be a, a very good thing from my, my, my perspective is like, you know, when you walk from Oregon, you're going to make it all the way to, you know, the border. Now, if you, it would be good if, you know, he's going to walk the whole way, you know, him or whoever's going with him is going to walk the whole way. But it will be good to have, you know, somebody on that border walk with him to the other border and then et cetera, et cetera, to the end of the border because that will be, you know, we, do, we don't want – I don't, I don't think I'd want anybody would, I mean, if they want to, to walk all the way over, but you know, some people like they're, it's going to be during school year or somebody that, you know, it's like, well, I can't make it all the way or I have no finances of getting back or, you know, but to walk with him from the border where he's coming from and walk to the inn or walk as far as he can and make it like that where it can be, you know, cause he'll have support, you know, he'll know. Cause if you're walking by yourself, all those states are with somebody else or maybe four people behind you or some, it, you know, it, it, it kind of like kind of feel a little bit depressing because it, you won't feel no, <laughs> feel no support. That's right. You know, you guys are reading your script. Be to on your, a lonesome trail. You'll be reading your script to yourself. Like, oh, man, we read this again. You know, but if you when you walk, you know, you guys will walk and see all these people, see all these new people. You know, they'll see what they're doing and they'll join in and just keep on walking. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a big adventure, man. I mean, oh, I yeah. never walked on across the United States before, you know. Yeah. So I think it's going to be pretty cool. Sure. Well, we're getting down to the bottom of the hour, and uh, <laughs> we need to take a break. I'm not sure if our guest is here or not for the second part of our show. Oh, she is? Good. All right. All right. So uh, we'll go to a little John Trudell. Chris, thanks again for You're coming. You're welcome. Thank you for having Best me. Best of luck to you on your walk. And just to mention, we're going to have John Trudell talking for a little bit during the break. He's coming to town September 11th. He'll be here for Hempstock. John Trudell and Bad Dog, they're playing Saturday afternoon, the 11th at 5 o'clock. And for more information, you can Google Portland Hempstock 2010. So let's go hear a little John Trudell, and then we'll bring in our next guest. Thanks for watching. And each and every human being is given exactly as much intelligence as they need to have their life participation in this reality. And intelligence. You know, because, like, I mean, see, I think that however it is we would say or want or hope or desire, all these things, to respect our Creator, I think that if we don't respect our intelligence, then we're not respecting our Creator <laughs> the way we should be respecting our Creator. Because this is the gift that the Creator gave to the human being. If we understand it as a gift, it's a gift that the Creator gave to the human being because it is our protection. It's our self-defense. It's, self it's our healing, all right? Our intelligence. <laughs> the, all right, the, our intelligence. See, our intelligence is our relationship to power, how clearly and coherently we use our intelligence. That's our relationship to the reality of power, is through clear, coherent use of our intelligence. You know, and to our intelligence, this is like our imagination, our creativity, our thoughts, our understanding, our action. Our intelligence, see, and it's always... It's the perpetual motion trip, you know, it's always going on, it's always working, it never shuts down, our intelligence is always happening. 
But see, we don't use our intelligence anymore. We've been programmed in such a way that someone else is using our intelligence. And it, you know, like turning, this is a, what, this some kind of a way turns into fuel to run a larger system. And what I'm saying about this now is like, the poison, the toxic waste from the mining of the being, the fears, doubts, and insecurities. Think about intelligence, creativity, imagination, and things of this nature, all right? And then think about the fears and doubts and insecurities. See, and this is, this is about facing the reality of who we are to ourselves, being real to ourselves in order to be real to our creator, in order to synchronize our prayers or whatever it is. But when we, we look at ourselves, all right, we look at ourselves and think about what, what are my fears, doubts, and insecurities, and how much of my life, how much of my day do they affect? <laughs> how, mu how much of my perception of reality do they affect? You know, how much, how much do they affect the others of the people that I, get, that I am close to? And how much do theirs affect them and how much do theirs affect me? I mean, that's, our, that's our imagination, our creativity, and our thoughts set into action in, an, in, in a misunderstood perception of reality. So this is, this is just like an example of the power that, we, that our intelligence represents and our accessibility to it. But we've been programmed in a way, see, to, never, to not recognize that that's really what it is. It's power that we use against ourselves. And so, you know, and it creates the energy that makes these, these very aggressive <laughs> behavior patterns emerge here, these civilizations, the way that they behave. So if we used, had clear and coherent, if we sought clear and coherent use of our intelligence, <laughs> things can happen. See? But we've been just programmed and conditioned in such a way, all right, to use it to create our own. Every day when we get up, we create our own reality because it's done through how we're going to perceive reality. We create our own reality, see, and they put us into the box of reacted thought. Reacted thought, that's the thought I had yesterday and the day before and the day before and 10 years ago and 20 years ago, right? And that thought is basically because we... Too many people view their participation in this reality from their inabilities, not from their abilities. And it's got to do with this, neg this doubt, fear, and blame thing, all right, that, that we have put into ourselves. All right? We had it put into us, and it bred very well, and it started to affect our perception of reality, and, it had, see, and we can't see ourselves clearly. So clarity is really an objective, all right? And because it's... And we use our intelligence all the time, so it's just a matter of us making certain decisions and understandings that we will decide how we're going to use it in a more clear, coherent manner. Because everything that's ever happened, it's, it's, when you come down to it, the civilizing process is about altering the, per the perceptional reality of the civilized. Alter their perceptional reality. It's always about altering the percep perceptional reality, all right? And, and, and when you look at it, you know, and you think, if, you just look, if we could look at each human mind, say, let's say every human being, and, and if, in a theoretical reality, if each human mind, you know, the intelligence was used with clarity and coherency, right? And you can look at it, see, that, you look at that as an energy pool, <laughs> how much energy that is untapped resource, see, and somebody's tapping it because somebody sees what I'm talking about, right? And they've been tapping it for a thousand years or three thousand years you know, as they've been evolving, as this, as this perception has evolved here. Because with our, and, and I, I, and the main thing that seems to be, that separates us from understanding the reality of who we are through our intelligence, all right, this idea, and I think the main thing that starts it, the first plant, the seed, the first thing that plants that and alters that perceptual reality in us is this idea of guilt, sin, and blame. All right? You know, this idea of guilt, sin, and blame. See, because we live in a technological reality now where it's pretty well accepted that it's the dogma, and, and I know that it affects people because it gets everybody when they're young. See, that's when everybody, you know, and then that, that'll, that'll ride all the life, you know, unless we understand to change it. But the idea that we committed a moral crime for being born, see, is ludicrous. I mean, it's insane. It is not a clear, coherent, it has, there's no basis to it, all right? But when we take it into our consciousness 
and believe it. We give it reality. And then we no longer see ourselves clearly. We see ourselves in a diminished light. Right? And all these things that happen are basically... And welcome back, everybody, to Native Nations. We've got Darlene Foster with us here as our second guest. But before we go into her little talk, Darlene is a storyteller. I want to mention a new book that has come out just recently. And this is called Shadow Tribe, The Making of Columbia River Indian Identity. And it's written by Andrew Fisher, who is a professor of history at William and Mary College at the at William and Mary College in uh, Virginia or somewhere. And Andrew did a really good job of doing research oh, about Columbia River Indians. They Mike, David, is your, is your mic on? Have, oh, no, my mic's not on. I'm sorry. Oh, his mic is not on, so he'll repeat what he just said real quick. <laughs> so everybody give a minute. All right, it should be. I apologize, more technical difficulties. <laughs> That's live TV for you folks. Yeah, you didn't want to hear Jim cussing around because I heard him. <laughs> As I was saying, <laughs> this book by Andrew Fisher just came out. It's a brand new book. And he came by our library and donated this to the StreamNet library. So I checked it out immediately and have read most of it. And he does an excellent write-up of mid-Columbia River Indians who were off the reservation and how they maintained their identity as a people and to this day how they have maintained their identity. So I highly recommend you get this book if you can find it. It gives a good explanation of life off the reservation from the reservation times. So pick this up if you can from Andy Fisher. And please read more everybody, it's good for you. So we will move to our special guest, Darlene. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We oh, appreciate sure. taking time out of your busy life. We've got to get your microphone okay. away from that. There you go. Thank All you. Right. And Darlene, you are a storyteller, but you also work at NARA. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Tell us a little about your background, your tribal identity. Um, I'm from Warm Springs. Um, I grew up over there until I went to school in Washington and I couldn't get a job back in Warm Springs so I got hired here at Kaiser Hospital and I worked there for 15 years and then I got married and quit to raise our children and then they got old enough I started working at NARA and it's been great. I've really been enjoying that a lot. Good. How long have you been there? Uh, 11 years now. Okay, and we have to remember to keep your mic oh, yes. clear, <laughs> please. And thank you. <laughs> and um, now Darlene, storytelling usually gets passed down through the family. I presume that's right. where you learned your stories. <laughs> right. I, uh, uh, really, the person that got me started was my, one of my nephews on my husband's side. He kept asking me, can you come and talk to my school? Because nobody believes that I have an Indian aunt. And um, so I, I would go up to his school up in Vancouver and talk. And, um, and then next thing I knew, my other nephews and nieces were asking me to come up and talk in the school. And then my son, when he started preschool, he started asking me to come to his school and, and talk. And uh, so I've done a lot of <laughs> storytelling at school, at the schools. Mm -hmm. I remember my son, I thought he wasn't listening when uh, he asked me to come when he was in eighth grade. And I looked at him and I thought, he's just laying there. He's not even listening to me tell the story. I don't know why he asked me to come. But I kept telling my story and I watched his mouth and he was mouthing the story as I was talking, so, mm -hmm. so he'd heard it for so many years. Great. So, but my mother was, was the one, that every time we'd get in the, on the highway, she would start telling me stuff. Uh, some of it uh, was really hard after she passed away. I couldn't go over the mountain without thinking of her telling me, this mm -hmm. is what happened here, this is what happened, you know. So, um, 
but uh, repetition, you know, that really does help you remember the stories. Um, you know, you're talking about this book. I wasn't going to talk about Sililo, but every spring, uh, my family would move down there to Sililo Village and fish. And um, I, one of the things that I remember is my mother telling me um, not to look at the falls. Uh, she'd say, that means you'll be naughty if you look at the falls. And uh, every time my cousins and I would try and ask each other, shall we go look at the falls? And uh, we would all remind each other, and as, as I thought about it as an adult, um, I realized that that was one of my, my mother's way of setting boundaries. And if I didn't listen to her about those boundaries, that I probably would never obey her about anything else. You know, so that was one of the things that I was able to finally think about. But one of the things that I remember that was kind of hard was uh, my cousins and I were sitting in, in the station wagon, and they went down to, the, to our little shack down there. And um, I remember hearing my mother and aunts and family, grandma, they were all down in that shack and they were just crying, wailing and crying and just really, um, and just really loud. And so I asked my cousin, um, did somebody die? And they said, I don't know. And it wasn't until later that we found out it was because they were getting ready to cover the, dam uh, cover the falls with the Dells Dam. And so they were mourning, already mourning their fishing ground like that mm -hmm. so yeah it really did die yeah it did <laughs> and so um, but I did have the opportunity of going back when they were doing the uh, memorial or whatever you call it the 50-year thing uh, I was there a couple years ago and um, I remember we uh, those of us that were there we went down to the water and we were singing and because it was um, kind of autumn at that time you could hear the leaves rustling and because uh, I had my eyes closed as we were singing these prayer songs and um, the way those leaves were rustling in the grass it almost sounded like the waterfalls it's really interesting for me to hear that because it was like I, you know I to have that memory of the falls come back to me in that song. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk well, to yes, you about changing. Well, yes, please, tell us. Tell <laughs> um, us the I, story, I brought this um, thimbles and beads dress with me today. Um, when my mother would talk about this dress, she would say, it's as old as the Dells. And as you know, we just celebrated um, Dells being 150 years old oh. um, uh, last year, I think. Yeah. And um, anyway, um, our original boundaries used to be from um, from Cascade Locks over to the Deschutes River and some other areas, Blue Mountains and stuff like that. And uh, and anyway, it went down to the Cascades. And, and then back over and up to Cascade Locks. And uh, one of my ancestors was one of the leaders, and they came to them and, and said, we just want a little bit of farmland. This is how they would tell us <laughs> the story. <laughs> we just want a little, a little bit of farmland. Bit. And, uh, you know, and when uh, they would show them on the map, you know, on a map, they didn't understand what they were looking at. Sure. And they said, we just want this. And, um, you know, so that was Cascade Locks, Hood River, uh, the Dells, and all of that. Uh, and um, they said the next thing they uh, knew, they were being herded like cattle down to what's now known as Canada. And um, these beads and thimbles are what my, my tribe got for that land. Um, 
your mic. Oh, <laughs> not quite a fair exchange. Uh, and uh, but it is beautiful. And he, um, my ancestor, that was the leader. He took the beads and symbols and he divided it up with everybody. And he said, make something with this so you'll remember what happened to our people and never let it happen again. So that's what this dress represents, is, um, is just to remember that. And I know when I tell this story in the schools, you know, I try to tell them I'm not here to whine about what happened to our people. I'm just here to tell you that this is our side of the story. This is what happened to our people because uh, it isn't in your history books. So I want you to know this is what the story is about our ancestors. And I don't know if you knew for the longest time there was a strip of land that they shorted us. The McQuinn, <laughs> the famous Ma McQuinn, McQuinn strip. strip. And um, we finally got that back. I think it was in 72. And uh, Yeah, that was a big victory for your tribe. It, you, that was a significant yeah, portion of your reservation it was. restored. Unf yeah, unfortunately it was really um, <laughs> logged. But anyway, it was, it was good to get that back. And then my other story, um, I was going to skip, try to go fast because I don't know how much time I have. We've got 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, one of my ancestors was called a dreamer. And he, um, he told everybody that the pioneers were going to be coming and they were going to flow in like a river and they were going to have on tutanik, you know, the hair that comes way out like that, you know, kind of bushy-headed, I don't know, like Wild Bill Hickok, what you imagine him to look like. <laughs> and their eyes would be um, like the sky, and it, they would twinkle like the star. Look, look, that's how they describe, you know, when somebody's got eyes like that and they kind of blink, and it just looks like a star twinkling. And, uh, and that they would bring with them knowledge that you could stand up to a tree and knock it over. And um, a snake that would carry the people and uh, the big bird that would carry the people back to see the great white chief. And um, metal fire. And um, so when I would talk to the schools, I'd say, what do you think this is? And some of the answers were kind of interesting. But, you know, the standing up to the tree was the chainsaw. And um, the, the train was the snake. And the bird is the plane. Going, uh, our tribal council members are going back to Washington, D.C. a lot. So that's what that vision was. And um, anyway, they knew. Um, so when they came, they were told to sing this song to them, and the song said all of these things. And um, if my mom were still alive, she would sing you this song. <laughs> but um, anyway, they watched them uh, come down, down the hill there at the area that's known as Shears Bridge. And um, they uh, just watched, and then one of the wagons tumbled and fell and one of the women and child were killed and so they grabbed their ropes made out of um, leather, horse hair, grass, you know, whatever and they went up and helped them lower their wagons and, um, and helped them float their wagons across the river and um, they had a bridge um, that they had made out of that rope also. And um, that bridge could only hold one adult and one child, and it took a day and a half to get all of the people onto the other side. And, um, and then after they got them to the other side, they really felt sorry for these people because they had um, rags on their feet, and, um, and like the women's dresses were all tattered and worn. And, uh, and they could tell that they were hungry also, so they spread out all this tule mat, that's what we use as a tablecloth, 
and they spread that all out, <laughs> they'd say miles of it, and they fed them um, the salmon, the eels, the berries, the roots, and, uh, and they, uh, in exchange, they gave back um, our people um, coffee beans and uh, macaroni, you know, it was long, hollow macaroni. And um, anyway, so the women strung their macaroni because they thought it was wampum. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so they slept with their necklace on and when they got up the next day, their necklace wasn't there anymore. What kind of wampum did they give us anyway? And, uh, and then they tried to cook the coffee beans. They just boiled it and boiled it and boiled it. And they said, what kind of beans did they give us? This doesn't even get soft. So <laughs> they, they didn't think they got a very good deal there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with the wampum and the beans. <laughs> and, uh, and then they asked some of the men to help them blaze the trail uh, to uh, what's now known as Oregon City. And, um, always believed that that was uh, the Barlow Trail. Sure. And um, anyway, they did give the men some money, some coins, uh, you know, like dimes and stuff like that, because my mother had that necklace for the longest time with those coins on a, on a necklace. But one of my nieces, she took it with her to school, to boarding school, and somebody stole it while she was at school. And, uh, but I didn't realize what a treasure that necklace was. Uh, it had so much history to it. So that was one of the things uh, about, about them. Uh, one of the things that happened when they were reenacting the, the Oregon Trail is the Oregon Historical Society asked my mother and aunts to go to Tai Valley and sing the song to the people that were reenacting the Oregon Trail. And um, it just, it felt so good because when you looked out at the audience, it looked like a lot of them were in tears, which made me think that some of them were probably uh, direct an ancestors to the ones that actually came on the Oregon Trail. And, uh, and then the Oregon Historical Society asked uh, her, uh, or the rest of our elders to come and sing that song again at Clackamas Park, which they did. So, and my, I know my brother, uh, when he was alive, he would talk about that and say how he honored he felt to be able to go and uh, share that song that foretold the, the pioneers coming. So what did that sign mean? <laughs> am, are, am I out of time? No, we've got four minutes. Four minutes, okay. Four yes. Minutes. <laughs> um, so, okay. What else do you want to share with us tonight, Darlene? Mm, well, one of the things that I always try to really talk about, I'm a food gatherer for our tribe, uh, I, like the berries and the huckleberries, I mean the huckleberries and the roots. And when we have our feast, a lot of our younger generation aren't honoring anymore that, that we have to thank Creator first for giving us the, this food. And uh, we always have a feast before, uh, beforehand. Like when I go to pick huckleberries, I can't eat the huckleberries, because I have to thank Creator first. And that's what that feast is, to thank Creator for giving us this food. And, uh, and nowadays, some of our younger generation are um, going out and either picking the berries before the feast and selling it to people, or, or to one of the stores that's across from our reservation. And, uh, or they're, uh, you know, they're just, it's just feels so disrespectful for them to do that. I wanted to say really fast, I don't know if I'll have time. My grandfather was a, uh, was a ceremonial fisherman on the Columbia. His name was Frank Quipama. And uh, 
in those days only the men went fishing for the salmon for the feast and only the men there was one man designated that cleaned the salmon and only the men cooked the salmon and only the men served the salmon and that first catch was to thank creator for providing it second catch was to provide for all of the widows and orphans in the village and um, and that mean, didn't mean just taking a salmon and throwing it down it meant um, actually like drying it or smoking it and make, uh, getting enough for them to get through the winter. And then after they provided for all of the widows and orphans, then they could go out and fish for themselves. In those days, the fish were probably a, as big as you are. Those, wow. those were huge salmon. I remember yeah. when my brother caught one, we, it, it just totally filled our kitchen table. And those were those were the days when the salmon. Yeah. <laughs> and they could run past uh, all the dams. That yeah. weren't, well, they weren't dams then, but yeah. uh, they would go clear up into Canada and Montana. Yeah. And some of those salmon would travel 1,300 miles up to 2,000 miles because we don't know how far out in the ocean they mm -hmm. go. But to have an incredible journey like that, you must be big. You must be strong. Yeah. Well, Darlene, I'm sorry we ran out of time. Oh. Maybe we can get you back sometime in the future, and uh, you can tell us some more stories. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, oh, sure. thank you very much. <laughs> See you in sure. Powell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. And uh, I know that Nara is putting on a convention here pretty soon, right? Okay. The um, I've got information. It's the... Spirit of Giving Conference coming up August 31st and to September 3rd. You can look at the Na Native American Rehabilitation Association of the Northwest. Look it up on Google and you find out all about them. And it's free. Free, yes. <laughs> so, uh, with CEUs. <laughs> thank you very much for watching our show tonight. We'll be back next month, the same time, same station. 